Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, I'm excited for what the word of the Lord's got in store for us today. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and go before the Lord in prayer. If you're ready to go before the Lord in the word of God, would you stand as we go before and let's go in prayer in honor and reverence today, if you're able to stand. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. Lord, we come into this place to not hear from a man. Lord, we don't come to hear from a woman or to to be entertained at church. But Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us today to minister to us, to, to plant a seed into our lives, the seed of the word of God, that it would grow and bear much fruit and flourish in our lives. We thank you that you would bless us, your church and your people. Lord, we don't see ourselves as better than any Anybody else, but as co-laborers in the body of Christ, so Lord, the blessings that we ask upon ourselves, God, we ask that you would bless the other churches around the Atlanta Empire and across the world that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Adventist brothers and sisters, our Baptist and Methodist and Lutheran brothers and sisters, our Episcopalian brothers and sisters. Lord, I thank you for our Pentecostals and Charismatic brothers and sisters. Lord, I ask that you set your hand upon Harvest Christian Fellowship on Emmanuel Baptist on Ecclesia Church. Father, I thank you that you set your hand upon sandals in the grove and crossroads and oak valley abundant living lord churches all across the inland empire and all around the world the way world outreach center father we thank you that you bless our brothers and sisters lord we are all truly many members of one body the body of christ working and serving together to build the kingdom of god and we thank you that there'd be a great and plentiful harvest here in the inland empire as well as around the world and lord we ask that all the glory all the honor and all the praise goes to you and we glorify you in jesus mighty name and we all said Amen. Well, as you're being seated, why don't you go ahead and grab your Bible, go ahead and open it up to the, to the Word of God. Let's open it up to the book of Hebrews. If you're just joining us today at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center on Sunday mornings, what we do is we go uh, line upon po- line, precept upon precept. The Bible was written that way, so we study it that way. And here we find ourselves in the book of Hebrews. And we're, we find ourselves in the fifth chapter. We've been here for quite some time, but, you know, we're getting real close. You can see the sixth chapter just kind of just verses away. So, I mean, we are inching our way through the Word of God, and I'm excited for what God's got in store for us today. The title of this morning's message is Growing into Maturity. Here we find ourselves in Hebrews in the fifth chapter, and we're talking about uh, the past couple of weeks. We've talked about the subject or the idea of, of our hearing, and the, we'll see this in just a moment. Uh, the writer of Hebrews uh, talks to the church, uh, even though this letter was written thousands of years ago to the, to the church, it's prevalent for you and I today to get this into our lives, to apply this to our lives, to study and to operate in the things of God. And he talked to the church about their dullness of hearing and says that there are some things in the Word of God that are hard to explain, not because of the subjects that they're difficult, but rather because they have allowed themselves to become dull of hearing. Uh, Some translations even say you've allowed yourself to become so lazy it's hard to understand. And so now then the author goes into now where we're at today is the subject of growing into maturity and looking at maturity. Now we're not talking about physical maturity. We're talking about spiritual maturity. We're not talking about growing up with age, but we're talking about growing in the things of God. And so here we find ourselves in Hebrews. In the fifth chapter, let's look at Hebrews in the fifth chapter, in the twelfth verse, Hebrews 5, 12. uh, The author of Hebrews begins to write, or speaking to the church, says, For though by this time you, the people of the church, you and I, ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles or the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. So here he says, the the author says, the the writer of Hebrews says, there has been a time where you have allowed yourself, you have come to find yourself. We came expecting that you would be mature and understanding because you have heard these things before. And now we come and we find you that you are still in in an infant mentality when it comes to the things of the word of God. You should be able to teach. You should be able to spread the word of God. You should be able to understand the oracles. If you remember a few weeks ago, that's the places and the things that God says. But you are uh, babies in Christ. He goes on to say, verse number 13. For everyone who partakes of only milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. This we see in, in the physical world here. The, the, the writer is giving us a physical example of babies. You think of a newborn baby. I have a three-month-old little girl. Right now she doesn't eat meat. Right now she doesn't eat baby food. She drinks milk. That's all she needs to sustain life right now is just milk. 
And uh, as infants in Christianity, as, as new believers in Christianity, the, the basics are what's needed to sustain life. But as we continue to grow, we need to advance our, our tastes. We need to advance our knowledge and our skills and the things of the Word of God so that we begin to advance in our understandings. And that's what he's talking about using the physical example. Verse number 14, solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So he goes on to give the description of a baby needing milk, but the mature or the adult knowing uh, that, that solid food is for them, that they need something more than just milk to survive, to continue to grow. And so here he's talking about the state of growing into maturity. Now we talked about this, and I don't want to go too, depth, too in depth on this. If you didn't hear last week's message with Pastor Jim, I encourage you to go online, visit it online. You can listen on free or you can pick up a CD after the service about uh, uh, what, what, what maturity looks like. And what we have to come to the understanding that uh, worldly maturity or maturity in the things of the world and maturity in the things of God or spiritual, in our spiritual walks with God are not the same things. That they're not judged by the same standards. They do not equally, they're not equal to each other. The truth of the matter is this, is that as you grow in your maturity or as you grow in your understanding, as you grow in your ideas and concepts and, and knowledge of the Word of God, that you become more mature in the things of God, that you actually distance yourself from the things of the world. Why? Because Jesus tells us in the Word of God through several occasions that the things of the world and the things of God cannot dwell together, that they are at war or uh, oppose each other. And so as we grow in our maturity or in our understanding of the things of God or the precepts of God, the will of God in our lives, we actually distance ourselves from the things of the world. Vice versa, if you grow into the things of the world and you become wise and savvy into the things of what's going on in the day and age and, and following everything that's going on in the world, it doesn't mean that you have to, don't have to know what's going on, but you become mature and you grow and you allow that to influence you then you grow yourself or you begin to find yourself distancing yourself from the things of God because the two are not the same. The two cannot be compared to the same, but there are some similarities in the process of growing in them, and we'll look at that today. Uh, we talked about this last week that the definition of spiritual maturity or godly maturity is simply this, is that when you begin to operate in the things of the Lord. That is the idea or the definition of godly maturity is that when you begin to operate in the things that God has for us, understanding that God has a will for us, understanding that we need to look and reflect more like Jesus Christ. Well, today I want to take you uh, further in that idea of maturity talking. Again, reminder, we are not talking about physical or, or uh, maturity of age or growing up, but we are talking about the spiritual maturity, our relationship and our understanding and our knowledge of the things of God. I want to talk to you today about some ideas about maturity, about growing up in maturity. The idea is, is that what it takes to grow in maturity or growing in maturity takes, and then we'll finish the statement. So as we get into the word of the Lord, I encourage you to hold on, grab a hold of some of these precepts. I, I, I know that as long as you get these and if you apply them to your life, if you can just grab a hold of one of these things, I, I know that your life will be benefited by this. I know that if you grab a hold of everything we talk about today, wow, leaps and bounds will you grow by. I tell you what, it's amazing what God has in store. But today we're talking about growing in maturity, what it takes. Number one, growing in maturity takes forward progress. Growing in maturity takes forward progress. Let's look at the physical example of what it takes to grow in maturity in, in our lives. Let, I have a son. He's, he's two years old now. And, 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 and you know, if you've ever seen a toddler, as toddlers or as babies, you're born, you're helpless. You come out, you can't control your movements. I have a little three-month-old daughter, and she just kind of swings her arms around. We kind of laugh because sometimes she hits herself and starts crying because she can't control her movement. But then as you progress in age, as you begin to, to learn the things uh, about life, you, you, as babies, you know, you, the parents put you, you, they put you on your back, and you learn how to roll over. And as you roll over on your tummy, then you learn how to get up on your arms. And as you learn how to get up on your arms, then you learn how to crawl. And as you learn how to crawl, then you learn how to stand. And then when you learn how to stand, you learn how to walk. When you learn how to walk, you learn how to run. Run, you learn how to run, you learn how to, how to jump, and it goes on and on and on, and you progress and you progress in life as far as forward movement. Could you imagine if in your life you, you decided, you know, I remember the day that my son took his first steps. It was 15 steps. We recorded it. We went crazy. Could you imagine as in life when you took your first steps, if you decided, okay, guess what? I did it. That was my goal in life was to learn how to walk. I just took my first steps. I don't need to go any further in life. Where would you be in life? Would you learn how to run? Would you learn how to, how about this? Would you learn how to stand on one foot and hold your balance? You see, there's a forward progress 
that's involved. And if you decide in your life that I'm good where I'm at, I'm complacent where I'm at, then guess what happens is you, you halt yourself from growing into spiritual maturity. Now we're talking about the physical. Let's, let's apply this to the spiritual life. Maybe you came to the church. Maybe you came broken. Maybe you came in a time of, of great need when you, you reached out to God because things in your life weren't going well. But all so often we see that people as they come to the church in their times of need, then all of a sudden life gets better. And they begin to back off the things of God because now things are good. They say, I'm good where I'm at. I'm happy with where I'm at. I was once addicted to this or I was once this way. But, you know, I've changed. I'm not that way as much anymore. And I'm good. I'm, I'm complacent where I'm at. And if we halt our forward progress, then we stop ourselves from growing in the maturity of the things of God and maturity in our understanding and our knowledge of the things of God. Are you with me this morning? So we have got to make sure in our lives that we don't stop forward progress. Look what it says in Hebrews in the fifth chapter again in verse number 12. We'll just put it up on the screens. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come, listen to that, you have come to need milk and not solid food. If you recall, in verse number 11, they says you have become dull of hearing. We talked about this. That implies that you were on your way to sharpening or to having a sharp sense of hearing. But something happened where you allowed yourself to dull in your hearing. And again, he says you were on your way to growing. You had the milk. You were growing. But now you have come. It means you, it's a progress. It's a process. You have allowed yourself to come back to the place of needing milk and not solid food. So there are things in our lives that hinder us all too often, as, as, it, as with the physical example, all too often when we're learning, we, we stumble and fall. But could you imagine as a toddler, could you imagine as a young child, when you were learning to walk or when you were learning to run or when you were learning to do things, when you fell and scraped your knee or when you fell and banged your elbow, if you let that fall or that injury stop your forward progress Rather than get up, d wipe the dirt off, put the band-aid on it, and keep going, where would you be? But it's the same thing in our walk with God and our maturity with God. Oftentimes, listen, guys, we're humans. We make mistakes. We trip and fall. We trip over bumps in our life. We make bad decisions, and then we get up and we look at the bad decision, and we say, because of the decisions or the mistakes that I have made, I can't go forward with God anymore. But let me tell you something. God knows what you have done, and God knows what you will do. God is not surprised or shocked by our mistakes. And so you and I can't allow the decisions or the mistakes that we make in our lives, the times when we stumble and fall, impede our forward progress in our relationship with God. There will be times like that. Look at a man in the Bible. You know this man. You've heard his name before. His name is David, the great David and Goliath, the great King David, the David that said he'd be even more undignified than this, the great David, the, the David who wrote the Psalms. The Bible tells us in Acts, the 13th chapter, that David is known as a man after God's own heart. But yet David was a man. If you read the life of David, David was a man who had incredible highs and he had incredible lows. As a matter of fact, there was one, you know the story, one time or one instance in David's life when he was at home or a place when he shouldn't have been there. He should have been out doing battle like he was supposed to have been. And he saw a woman on the rooftop bathing. He called that woman to him. They had an adulterous affair because she was married. She got pregnant. You know the story maybe that David called her husband out of battle to try to cover up his sin and see that her husband, hopefully her husband would sleep with her to think that he got her pregnant rather than David. And that never happened because her husband was a righteous and integral man and said that while my friends are out there, while my comrades are out there, fighting I can't do this so you know the story that David sends him out to battle tells the generals put him in the front line and as the battle rages back off from him to allow him to die so David commits murder to to what becomes his wife Bathsheba's husband at the time Uriah and David is called out by the prophet. There are many times, you see, David faced, was faced with pride. David was faced with lust. David dealt with anxiety and, and stress. David dealt with many issues in his life. But here's the deal. The prophet Nathan comes to David and confronts him on his sin. 
and confronts him on his mistakes. And David lies prostrate before God and repents in his heart. Look what it says in Psalms in the 51st chapter. I'll just put it up on the overhead. You can write notes. Go read it later if you'd like to. This is the Psalm that David writes as Nathan or after Nathan has confronted and the prophet has confronted him from his sin. And this is a part of just a part of that Psalm. And he says, make in me, this is David's cry to God, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You can sense the spirit of David's repentance. Verse number 11 goes on to say, Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Verse number 12, it says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Moving on, it goes on to say, Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Remember we were reading that you should be teachers. But you need milk. And here David makes a mistake, but he says, God, I'm going to take the mistake that I've made. Forgive me. Please don't leave me. Restore me back to what I was. I understand that there are consequences for my mistakes. This is a world that we live in where we sow what we reap. Therefore, there are things that I have sown that I have to reap the consequences of. But God... Create in me a clean spirit and I will teach, I will take the mistakes that I have learned and apply them so that other people will not make those mistakes. And so David is a man after God's own heart, not because he was a perfect, clearly he wasn't. David is a man after God's own heart because when he made a mistake, he acknowledged his mistake and he moved forward from his mistake and he didn't make the same mistake again. And that's the key in our lives is that we make mistakes. God's not surprised or shocked by our bad decisions. The, 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 the question is, is what are we going to do with the mistakes? What are we going to do with the decisions that have led us to where we're at today? Are we going to look and say, well, I can't change. Or, well, I can't do this. Or are we going to look and say, God, I know that this is not what you have in me. Create in me a clean heart and I will take what you have given to me and I will apply it and I will become a teacher so that other people don't live what I've lived. See, forward progress leads us into maturity. Are you with me this morning? We're talking about growing into maturity out of Hebrews in the fifth chapter. Number two, growing in maturity takes a growth in skill. Growing in maturity takes a growth in skill. You think about it like this. Anytime you enter into something, anytime you pick up something, or you start a new job, or whatever it might be, yeah, oftentimes, very rarely, does anybody start off as a master. You start off, as, as you learn the skills, it's very basic principles, but as years go by, you become good at what you do, and you learn and you grow in your skill. You know, I think about it like this. I've used this illustration multiple times. Many of you know that I like to do woodworking. It's one of the hobbies that I do. I, you know, I guess for me, I, could, I just would like to follow in, in my Savior's footsteps. Just kidding. <laughs> but I like to do woodworking. And so one of the things that I like to do is I like to take my house. We, my wife and I, when we bought it, was a repossession. It was, in, it was in dismal shape. It was left very bad. And So we like to take the things that I have and the ability that God's given me to be creative and to do things with my hands and to, to, to make our house nicer. And I remember when we first moved in, I built this thing called a chair rail in a room. A chair rail, if you don't know what that is, it's very simple. It's a piece of molding. Just, just whatever decorative figure or molding it is. That's about the height of the back of a chair that you, you glue to a wall. You just glue it with construction adhesive, staple it or nail it to the wall, paint it. Okay, that's it. Very simple, very, I mean, basic, basic, basic process. But years and years ago as I was beginning this process, you would have thought, oh, I, let me tell you something. Praise God that there was no CCTV. Praise God that nobody was recording the things that I was saying because I, uh, you may have heard this term before, I had lost my salvation over the chair rail. I'm telling you, I mean, I threw things. I said every high school word you could say. I quit. My wife would point out the slightest flaw and I would fly off the handle. The simplest of projects. But then as years have progressed, now my, my daughter, we decided we wanted to do this thing called wainscoting or beadboarding in her room. And we did this thing, and it was a much more involved process than the chair rail was. And I did it from start to finish all on my own. I like to do those things because I like to look at my wife when I'm done and kind of flex my muscles and be like, I did it, girl. I did it, mama. And I had finished this, this, this wainscoting and finished painting, and I did everything from start to finish all on my own. And... And my wife came to me after the project and she said, you know, babe, I'm really proud of you. And I'm like, I know, it's good. You know, like when God in Genesis saw that he created man and he said, this is good. It's kind of like when I looked at my daughter's room and I saw what I had created and I thought, this is good. 
But she said, you know, it wasn't because of how you did it or how good it looks or whatever. She says, I'm really proud of you because you did this process, and I know that this was a lot harder than things that you've done in the past, but yet never once in this process did you lose your temper. Never once when you ran into something or a trouble or a problem did you fly off the handle, but you dealt with the problem, you fixed it, and you moved on, realizing that the end product will be good. And see, that's the state of growing in skill. In our Christian walk, we start with things. We may, You know, the Bible tells us to turn the other cheek. The Bible tells us to love our neighbors. The Bible tells us to bless those who persecute us. The Bible tells us to rejoice when we fall into various trials. And as we're drinking the milk and as we're babies in Christianity, maybe we don't apply that or we don't get that skill right off the bat. But as we grow in the skill, as we grow in the things of God, all of a sudden we begin to get the word of God inside of us and we begin to look back and say, I understand things that I didn't quite get in the beginning. Now I look back at that and I read the word of God. It comes alive to me because my skill or my understanding in in the things of God has grown. You see, we understand the concept or the precept of skill in the physical, but what about our skill in the spiritual? You know, your skill could be your knowledge. How about what you think? The things that come on the inside. The Bible says that a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the man speaks. How about what you say? How about when you respond to somebody? How about when you, when you, uh, the way you conduct yourself, the things that you do? You see, your skill starts on the inside, but it grows from the inside to the outward, outward motion of man. It's on the inside and it's on the outside. And then when we grow in our skill, we grow in our maturity of God. Look what it says in Hebrews, the fifth chapter. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. The word of righteousness, the Amplified Bible says the doctrine of righteousness. The the teachings, the New International Version calls it the teachings of righteousness. You see, they are unskilled in what it takes or what the Bible says a righteous person ought to be like. A person that is in right standing with God, like we talked about last week. A person that becomes a reflection of Jesus Christ. The more we grow in our skill, the more we realize that we can be a reflection of Jesus Christ. The more we grow in our skill, the more we realize that we can do the things that Christ told us that we could do. But it takes a growing in skill. It takes a dedication to learning. Paul the Apostle speaks to the church in Colossae, in the book of Colossians. The Bible tells us, uh, uh, I love the New King James uh, uh, version of uh, the Rock Bible. In in the beginning of the Bible, in the beginning of every book, there's a little uh, excerpt or a commentary about the the word. And as I was studying, it said the church of Ephesus is the reflection or the example of the body of Christ. The church of Colossae or the church uh, to the book of Colossians is the example of the church of Christ because they've got it. They're doing good in what they're doing. So Paul the Apostle writes to them in the first chapter and exhorts them. And look what he says in verse number nine, hearing about their, their growth and hearing about their spirit. He says, for this reason, since we heard the day we heard of it, we do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You see, knowledge, skill, wisdom. You be filled with the will of God. Look what it says in verse number 10. For that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. See, Paul's prayer, Paul's exhortation to the church was, I'm so glad to hear that you're growing. I'm so glad to hear of the Spirit of God that's inside of you. And I pray that even though you're growing, that you get more of the Word of God in you. I pray that you get more of the Spirit of God in you. I pray that your knowledge of the precepts and the will and the thoughts of God, the character, nature, and attributes of God grows inside of you and that you increase, that you bear more fruit. So knowledge or skill takes a dedication to learning. You know, skill takes a stepping out in faith. Still, skill, growing in skill, growing in your knowledge takes a, a stepping out and trying new things. It takes studying. It takes reading. Let me encourage you. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of books about concepts and precepts of the Word of God. But let me say this to you. That while I'm a big fan and I myself have been uh, made it a point to read more books about the Word of God, don't stop solely upon the books of the Word of God. Why? Because you will grow in the skill of reading commentary rather than reading the Word. So books are good, books are helpful, and I don't want to decrease or devalue anything of that nature. They're good, and you need to do that, but don't let books be the only source of your knowledge or your skill, but rather the Word of God in your life. 
So grow in the skill, grow in the knowledge. It takes a stretching, it takes stepping out. Maybe you need to grow in faith. Maybe you need to grow in your trust or, uh, for God in your finances or for in your life or in your prosperity, whatever it might be. You need to learn to grow, grab the word of God and learn it, get it in you, study it and grow in the skill so that you can look back and see, wow, I have grown in my spiritual maturity, amen? amen. One more for this morning. Can we do one more? Can you, can you guys handle one more for this morning? We're talking about growing into maturity. Last one for this morning. Growing into maturity takes, number three, using what is learned. Growing into maturity takes using what is learned. Let me give you this really, really simple, really practical application. Book smarts versus life smarts. You know, you can study you can, you can read all about, you can know exactly how to fly a 747 because you read the manual, because you read other people's experiences, but until you get behind the, the joystick of the airplane and you see all the billion buttons that are in the cockpit of the airplane, until you apply it to your life, you really don't know how to do it. How about this? Faith in theory versus faith in practice. We can teach, we can tell, well, the Bible says that faith is a substance, or we can say that faith is what we believe, or faith is, the, is, is, a, is a persuasion, or faith is a, is a conviction, or we can say that we can tell somebody what the Word of God says about faith, but until we live faith, until we experience faith, can we really turn around and say, let me tell you what the Word of God says about it, and let me tell you how it works. Let me tell you how it does it. Let me tell you. You see, so there's more than just the knowledge or no more than growing in skill. Christianity is not simply an internal process. Christianity is not simply just coming to church and hearing the word of God and walking away. You know that you know the Bible tells us, we read about this last week, that, the, that, the, that, the, we, that God gave us some apostles, some teachers, some preachers, evangelists for the equipping of the saints. You come to church to hear the word of God so that you can be equipped. What do you get equipped for? To use your equipment. Where do you use your equipment? In your life. So spiritual maturity comes from applying or using what you have learned. Look what it says in verse number 14 of Hebrews. Verse number 14, it says, Solid food belongs to those who are full of age. You read that and you think, well, they're talking about age. You're, you read that and you think solid food belongs to people who are advanced in their understanding. They've lived a long time. That's common sense. You see, that's worldly maturity. That's, that's physical maturity. But look what he did. He doesn't stop at that. He says, solid food belongs to those who are full of age. That is, he, he goes on to say, that is, is, I'm going to explain what that statement means. That is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. See, so solid age is, or solid food is not simply in the physical. It comes to somebody who's older, somebody who's, who's grown in their understanding, somebody who's become developed. But solid food, spiritually, the precepts or the advanced concepts of God, the ability to spread what you have been given to somebody else comes not from age, but rather but from taking what you have heard, applying it to your life, and now you can go and spread it to the Word of God. You know, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, it's not on the overhead. In 2 Corinthians, in the first chapter, the Bible tells us that God is a God of comfort, that we can ask God for comfort in our time of need, but he doesn't stop there as Paul exhorts the church. He says that you would have comfort so that someday you could give the comfort that God gave to you to somebody else who is in need of comfort. You see, that's the process of spiritual maturity. You get it? Oh, Lord, I need you to pray. I need prayer. I need prayer. I need prayer in my life. Oh, my life's falling apart. But someday your life through spiritual maturity will not be falling apart and you can begin to pray and teach and spread the love of God to others in your life by applying. <laughs> spiritual maturity is so essential for our walks with God. Look what it says in Luke, the 8th chapter, and we will finish actually with this. Luke in the 8th chapter. Luke in the 8th chapter, Jesus is giving us a parable. It's called the parable of the sower. As you're turning to Luke in the 8th chapter, we'll pick up on the overheads, verse number 11. But let me read to you just quickly the parable that Jesus speaks of. Verse number 5 in the 8th chapter, Jesus says, A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, 
Some fell by the wayside, the seeds, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. So Jesus gives us four practical, physical examples of a seed planted. You know, if you've ever planted grass or you've ever planted a garden or a plant, you know that if there's a rock, especially in California where I live in my house, there's a, a riverbed rocks in, that are shallow in the ground. And as the grass gets or the, the temperature warms up, the rocks warm up and they, they begin to wick the moisture out of the grass. And I see dead spots in my lawn. And there's certain things in, in cultivation areas of, of the soil that if the soil isn't prepared right, that the seed or the plant can't flourish. And some people like to focus on the mathematics saying that 75% of this is sitting. I don't want to get into the mathematics of this, but look what Jesus as he explains this uh, parable to his disciples because they looked at him and they said, we don't get what you're talking about, Jesus. Look as he describes this parable, look at what he says. And he says, verse number 11, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are those who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who in their heart receive the word with joy. And those, these have no root who believe for a while, and in the time of temptation fall away. Verse number 14, now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who when they have heard the word, when they have heard go out and are choked with cares, riches and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on good ground are those having a good and noble heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. You see, here's an interesting example. Is Jesus gives us four examples of the condition of man's heart. Of, of the four examples, all four examples heard the word of God. All four of them, the seed was sown. Somebody planted it in their heart. But look at what it says. It says, one of them, the, the, the devil came and took from them out of their heart, the seed that was sowed. The birds, he uses the example, the birds came and ate the seeds or the seeds were trampled on the ground. It says in verse number 12, those by the wayside are when they hear, the devil comes and takes the word out of their hearts. The, uh, the second example is when they hear, they hear it with joy. Praise God, I got saved, hallelujah. But then it goes on to say, who believe for a while and in the time of temptation fall away. These are the ones that they get into this euphoria belief of Christianity that when I get into Christianity, when I get into this, that life is going to be all fairy tales and rainbows and the sun's going to shine every day and that nothing bad will ever happen to me ever again. But the truth of the matter, guys, is that we live in this world. We live in an imperfect world. Yes, we have the blood of Jesus Christ that covers us. Yes, we have a greater calling. But the truth is, is that the Bible says that we will endure hard our times. Jesus says that the world hated him, and if they hated him, they'll hate us. But be of good cheer, remember his exhortation, because he has overcome the world. But if we buy into this belief that Christianity is all just happiness, and I feel good now, or I came and I was in need of God, and I got the things of God, and I feel much better because I was in such a need, but now I'm happy, I don't need anymore. The Bible says then life comes, or temptations come, and they have no root because they haven't dug deep, because they haven't developed spiritual maturity, and they fall away. The third example is, is those that, that come and they're planted and the weeds grow and they're choked by the cares of this life. They're choked by the riches. They're distracted. They grow up and they say, great, this is good. This is wonderful. But as they grow into the things of God, they realize that there are things growing to their left and to their right. They begin to look into the left and to the right. They focus on the things of the world. They focus on the career more than God. They focus on the success more than God. They focus on the outside more than the things of God on the inside. And they get distracted by the cares and the pleasures of this world. And they bring no fruit to maturity it says and then and then there's the good and noble heart the spiritually mature ground 
You think about it, they cultivate the ground. What do you do as a, as, a, as, a, as a farmer, as somebody who plants? You put into the ground, you make sure that there's the nutrients in the ground. You stir up the ground, you make sure that it's not hard. You make sure that it's not rocky. You make sure that there's not things that are going to come and you weed your garden bed or you put fertilizer in that. And that is right there, spiritual maturity. Why? Because you're sowing into the ground being your heart, your life, the seed as it gets planted because you have a good and noble heart, the spiritual mature that says, you know what, God, your word is important. God, what you say is more important. God, what you, do, what you want me to do is more important than what I want to do. God, your will over my will. God, your plan over my plan. The spiritually mature, the, the noble and good heart <laughs> bears fruit. You remember what it said in Hebrews? It said that, that they would discern by reason of use, having exercised their, their senses, they'd be able to discern both good and evil. The noble and the good, the mature heart be able, was able to look at life and say, you know what, this is the attack of the enemy, and I know how to deal with it. Why? Because I've grown in my skill. This is not of God. That is of God. I'm going to follow the path of God. And by reason of use, by growing up in the things of God, by growing in your skill for the things of God and applying them to your lives, you, be able, you will be able to see and discern what is of God and what is not of God. You see, the enemy, the, the, the device, the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. For the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, in the Bible, you don't see places where the devil shows up with legions of, of demons saying, hey, give it to me or you surrender to me or you're going to die. But rather you see illustrations like Adam and Eve in the garden where the devil comes and plants a seed and says, oh, you're not going to die. Your eyes will be open. Or Jesus, when he's in the temptation, says, if you're the son of God, won't God rescue you if you throw yourself over this cliff? You see, he plants a seed, but as growing and learning and applying what you have learned with a noble and a good heart, like the Word of God says, you can discern, hey, no, that's temptation. Hey, no, that's not of God. Hey, no, the Bible says to cast down every argument or thought that exalts itself above the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and you can apply the Word of God and grow strong in the things of God and be successful in life, be prosperous in life, see your family saved, see your children grow and be prosperous, see your businesses grow and be prosperous. Why? Because spirit. Spiritual maturity is essential to our walk with God. And let me tell you something. The Bible tells us, Jesus tells us in John the 15th chapter, that we should bear much fruit, that when we ask God what we desire, that God would give it to us, that we, that God would be blessed. So we are blessed by God so that we can bless God further in our lives. Why? By bearing fruit, by being spiritually mature, and by going through things, by keeping forward momentum in our lives. Don't let your mistakes stop you from moving forward with God. But deal with them and move forward with God. Grow in skill. Get into the Word of God. Listen to the word of God. Listen to the, to the things of God. Get some, get some commentaries. That's good, but read the word of God. And finally, apply. Use what you have learned in your life and see and watch yourself grow in spiritual maturity. See, it's baby steps. You won't even realize that you're growing until you look back and face an issue that you've already faced once before and look, man, I handled this totally different. It's all up to us. The decision is ours whether or not we want to grow in spiritual maturity. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord this morning? Hey, there's one more thing I want to do. I want to ask everybody, please remain seated. Thank you for those of you who, have, uh, who stayed. For those of you who left, I have, we have speakers in the bathrooms and in the hallways and in the foyer and everywhere you're at. I want to encourage you, listen up. You need to hear this. I want to ask you a question. Let me ask you this question. You answer it within your heart. Give me a moment, just a moment more of your attention. If you were to leave this place and you were to die, hypothetically speaking, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question, but you know, nobody's going to know the answer except you and God. Why don't we go over some of those answers that maybe you've had in your heart? You know, it'd be a travesty for us to come together and hear the, hear the word of God, sing praise and worship songs together, and not give you the, uh, the opportunity to examine and determine your eternal outcome with God. So why don't we come over, why don't we look at some of those answers? You know, you might have said, Pastor Luke, if I was to die, I hope I get to heaven. Pastor Luke, I sure want to get to heaven. I think I'm going to go. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God will you find that you can hope, that you can think, or that you can want or desire to get to heaven, and because that's the case, that you're going to get there? That nowhere in the Word of God will you find that God will look upon you because your genuine desire to get to heaven and say, well, they want it bad enough, I'm going to let them have it. No, we're in the Word of God where you find that you can't get to heaven because you think so. You can't get to heaven because you want to. You can't get to heaven because you desire to get there. There's more to it than that. 
Did you know you can't get to heaven because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, or as a Muslim, or any other type of world or religion? So you might think that, well, that must mean I'm a, a default or by classification I'm a Christian. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you can get to heaven because you weren't raised one way or the other. Therefore, by, therefore, by default or by classification, you're going to get to heaven. You can't get there that way. It's not that way. You won't find it in the Word of God. Nowhere will you find that. You know, you might even say, well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I was baptized as a baby. My parents uh, took me to Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes as a child. I went to church on Christmas or on e and on Easter. My parents told me all my life that I was a Christian. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Did you know nowhere in the Word of God will you find that because you're baptized or christened as a baby that you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere will you find that because you attended Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes or because you went to church on Christmas or on Easter because you're sitting in service today? that you're going to get yourself into heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God. Did you know nowhere in the Word of God because you call yourself a Christian or because your parents told you you were a Christian or because your parents told you that your family was a Christian family mean that you are going to get into heaven? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you've given yourself a title that you're going to find your way into heaven. That's like saying you go sit in your garage and call yourself a car. At no point will you ever become a car because you told yourself you're a car. See, there's more to it than that, and I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough to not beat around the bush and to not play games, but to tell you the truth about what the Word says. You see, the bottom line is, is that it's God's heaven. The only way to get to God's heaven is God's way. You know, you can't get to heaven because you're a good person. A lot of people think that, well, good people go to heaven. Did you know nowhere in the Word of God will you find that good people go to heaven? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that your good deeds, that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. Nothing we could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It's not about the outward or it's not about the good deeds. You might even say, well, Pastor Luke, I volunteered in the children's ministry or in the youth ministry at my last church. I sang in the choir. I have a card in my wallet that says I'm a member to a church. Doesn't that mean something? Do you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you volunteered in the children's ministry and the youth ministry or because you sang in the choir or carried the pastor's Bible or became a member of a church or an organization that that means that you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere will you find that. There's more to heaven than just your actions. As a matter of fact, a man by the name of Nicodemus was having a discussion with Jesus in John, the third chapter. You can read it for yourself. They were talking about eternal life and they were talking about heaven. And the Bible describes to us that Nicodemus was a, of the Pharisees, a leader of the Jews. What that means to you and I is that Nicodemus was a spiritual leader of his time. That he was like the equivalent of our day and age, a, a doctorate or a PhD in theology. Nicodemus served in the church, he taught in the synagogue, he gave to the poor, he said all the right things, he did all the right things. Nicodemus had memorized scriptures. And yet, as Jesus and Nicodemus are talking about eternal life, you would think that Jesus would say to Nicodemus, man, you just keep on going, you just keep doing the good works that you're doing, and you'll find yourself in heaven. But Jesus says to Nicodemus, the only way you can get into heaven is to be born again. You've heard that term. Hollywood popular culture, society may have made a mockery, may have made that or dragged that term through the coals to make you think that it means radical, crazy, out of control, or weirdo Christianity. But let me tell you something. I don't care what Hollywood says. I don't care what society says. The term born again from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible in the eyes of God has always meant the same thing. And here's what it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with God. It's not about your mental ascent towards Him. It's not about your carnal knowledge of who He is. You know, the Bible tells us that the demons in hell know who Jesus is. The Bible tells us that the devil himself can quote Scripture. Therefore, you would think that if it was about your knowledge, they might find themselves there. But guess what? They're not going to heaven because it's not about your mental ascent or your carnal knowledge of who He is. It's about all of your heart. It's about all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. Let me prove that to you in the book of the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Jesus Christ is speaking to the church and he says, when I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What does lukewarm mean? You think of lukewarm in the terms like this, it's like a warm soda on a hot day. It just doesn't do the job. In terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out, you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, occasional church attendance, token prayer. Hey, maybe you got a Jesus tattoo sometime in your life or a cross or St. Christopher around your neck, but you're not living wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against him either, but you're riding the fence. And Jesus says, if that's you living lukewarm, you are deceived, you are tricked in thinking that you're going to make it into the kingdom of God. Well, then how do we get to heaven? 
You know, we can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. The only way you and I can get to heaven is God's way. It's God's heaven. It's God's way. And Jesus Christ says this. He said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father except through him. So today, let's do it God's way. And here's what I'm going to do. In a, count of, in a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm going to smack my hand on the Bible just like this. Bang! And when I smack my hand on the Bible real loud, just like that, I want to give you the opportunity to acknowledge that you want to give Jesus Christ all of your heart. You want to give him all of your life. You say, what I'm going to ask you to do is pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it and put it right back down. You say, Pastor Luke, I, don't, I just don't think that I can do that. You see, you got to do that. you got to go before men. Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're acknowledging, Pastor Luke, I want to give him all my heart. Pastor Luke, I want to give him all my life. Say, I don't know, Pastor Luke, I'm just going to be embarrassed. The people I came with, they're going to know where I'm at. They're going to know where I stand. Listen, you might be embarrassed, but get over it. Wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment right now than an eternity in hell because you couldn't move forward for God and make forward progress in your relationship? The opportunity is yours. You see, God's not a manipulator. God's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in or make his way in. The truth is, is that God already did everything he could to ensure your place in heaven with him for eternity by giving for you his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, a bloody mess, uh, to hang a spectacle on the cross for all to see. You see, God's already laid the path for you to get there. All you have to do is give him all of your heart, all of your life. He gave his everything for you, and in return, he wants your everything. So who should raise their hand in just a moment if you've never given him all of your heart? You've never given him all your life in a moment? Get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Put it right back down. Who should raise their hand? Maybe you're not sure. Hey, maybe you did this at a Billy Graham crusade or a Harvest crusade, but you never really followed through with it. If that's you in this place, get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it and put it right back down. We'll go forward from there. Who should get their hands up? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, if you've been running from God instead of to God, today, let's make this the day you make forward progress and you start moving forward and go hot in your relationship with Jesus Christ and ensure your place in heaven for eternity, leaving hell behind. If that's you in this place, get ready. Hands are getting ready to go up. If you're watching online or you're watching on the TV, whatever it is, wherever you're at, if you're in the foyer, if you're at home, or if you're in the Love Rock Cafe, if you, when I count to three and I, and I smack my hand on the Bible, if that's you, you get your hand up. If you're in this place today, get your hand up so I can see it. I'll acknowledge it. I'll put it right back down. And let's move forward in your relationship today. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't leave this place without making sure. Let's change destinies together today. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. If that's you, get ready. Hands are getting ready to go up all over this place. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the place today. I see you. One, two, three, four. I see you. Five, I see you right there. Six, I see you back there. Six wise people. Seven, I see that hand. Seven wise people. Anybody else? If you got your hand up, I see you. Usher's pointing over here. Eight, all right, I see you. Right over where I, give me a little wave. I see you right there. Nine wise people. Ten, I see you right there. Eleven back in the back. Praise God. Eleven wise people. Twelve, I see you back there. Twelve wise people. Number, number 13, number 14, number 15. You say, man, I wonder if I should. Should I do this today? I see that hand right there. I see that hand. That's uh, 12, 13. Thirteen wise people. Anybody else in the place today? Say, man, I wonder if I should. Let's move forward for God and let's make forward progress in your relationship. Don't let your past dictate where your future goes. That's God's responsibility. Give your heart, give your life to Jesus Christ today. Anybody else in this place, you say, Pastor, look, I feel like you're pushing. I feel like you're pressuring me. Don't you know that the devil, I see you right there, number 14. Don't you know the devil is keep pressuring you to keep your hand down? I see you, number 15. You ought to be thankful that somebody loves you enough, respects you enough to fight for you, to get your hand up. Come on. If that's you in this place, get your hand up. Say, now, I wonder if this guy's going to ever shut up. Get your hand up and I will. Come on. Anybody else in this place today? Anybody else? 15 wise people. 15, 16 wise people. Anybody else in the place today? Well, let's praise God for 15 wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do for the 15 of you that raised your hand. For the five others, for the 20 total that didn't raise your hand, if you, if you, uh, you are serious about this, you said you want to give them all your heart, you said you want to give them all your life, we want to help you, let's change destinies together. We're in a moment, we're going to sing a song, and I want to ask you to be bold, to get out of your seat, get out of your chair, grab your sweater, your Bible, your purse, a friend if you need a friend as we all stand together. Get out of your seat, get out of your uh, chair, and come and meet me up here at the altar. Let's, let's change destinies together. That's you, come on. Get out of your seat. Come on, you come. Come on, you can come. Come on. If that's you, if you're serious about this, you come on. Come on. I give you my soul. From the back, from the front, come on. If that's you, come on. You can come, come on. Come home, come on. Come, it's not too late. 
you'd like, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair from the family rooms, wherever you're at. You can come. Praise God, you guys came. Hey, listen, today is a new day. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. So here's what we want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Joel, like Noel, but Joel. Pastor Joel is going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. So we're going to help you with that. We're going to get some free literature into your hands to help you get strong in the ways of the Lord, to help encourage and build you up. And we're going to do one more thing. We're going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We call them spiritual personal trainers. You go to the gym, you see a personal trainer to make sure that you're building the muscles, make sure you're not wasting your time. A spiritual personal trainer is a friend that will meet with you before service. They'll get you a cup of coffee or something right there at the Love Rock Cafe. They'll teach you some things about the Word of God for a couple of weeks here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center to build you up, to get you strong, to start, start you on your path to spiritual maturity so you don't go back to the life that you came from. So if you guys would just go right over there with Pastor Joel.